Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 49 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about, get ready for it, folks, the Roswell UFO crash. This I'm really excited about this. Can you tell? (laughs) I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So I I, I make no bones about that. I'm very excited. I, I love talking about UFOs. I'm very excited about that. And, of course, Roswell is the thing. So let's let's get into talk about what what it is Roswell is. Uh. On July 8th, 1947, 72 years ago this week, Americans were startled when the Army Air Force announced that they had taken possession of a crashed flying saucer. Now, the Air Force said that the saucer had crashed on a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico. But the public then suffered whiplash when the Air Force quickly retracted the story and said it wasn't true. And then for years, the story was hidden. But decades later, it was revived by UFO researchers. And the story of the Roswell crash has become the most, the single most famous incident in UFO history. And then in the 1990s, public pressure forced the Air Force to admit that they had lied when retracting the story. And something strange really did happen at Roswell in 1947. And that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, let's be honest. Was Roswell really Quark and Rom traveling through time from Star Trek's Deep Space Nine? Tom, you can't just blurt out the truth at the beginning of the episode. It doesn't fit the narrative. You've got to got to build towards that. I I guess I got so excited, I forgot and jumped right to the end. (laughs) Okay, no, so seriously. So how much of the whole Roswell uh, phenomena will we be talking about on this episode? There's so much to talk about this. There's so much research that has been done that we're really only going to be able to cover a fraction of it this time. I'd love to be able to just go into all the stories that people have told about Roswell, all the different things that people who lived in the area have said. Unfortunately, that would make this a book length podcast and actually several book length podcasts because many books have been written on this subject. So we'll really only be able to talk about kind of an overview of the situation this time, but we'll look at it more in some future episodes and be able to get further into some of the stories. Okay. So I understand that you took a trip to Roswell a few years ago. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was, uh, it was very interesting. Uh, It was really clear that the UFO crash story was incredibly important to the local economy. It seemed like every business on the main strip in town was selling alien stuff and there were alien decorations all over everything. Even the streetlights had alien faces painted on them that I guess the town council had done. The Chamber of Commerce had a sign on its front door in allegedly alien writing, which was actually just gibberish in a Greek font. (laughs) I got to visit the Roswell UFO Museum, which was fun, and I drove out to near one of the crash sites. And I also went through an alien-themed haunted house that they had there, which was kind of scary in parts. They had guys, these teenage guys running the haunted house, like sneaking up on you in the dark and stuff. (laughs) It sounds fun and very campy. Yeah. Set the stage for us then. What was happening in 1947 when the story of, of from Roswell broke? You'll recall just a couple of weeks ago here on the show, we covered the Kenneth Arnold UFO sightings that kicked off the modern UFO era and that introduced the term flying saucer. That was part of a wave of sightings in 1947. And over the next two weeks, the press was just filled with accounts of flying saucers as the wave played out. People were fascinated by the story. And I wanted to do this episode, since we'd just done the Kenneth Arnold ones, time to coincide with the anniversary of that. I wanted to follow up with Roswell, timed for this anniversary. I wanted to do them both in the same year, so you could see just how close those two events were to each other. So they're in very close proximity. It's just a couple of weeks later when Roswell happened. And early on uh, Tuesday, July 8th, the Roswell Army Airfield issued a press release. Yeah, and here's what it said. The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers 
and the sheriff's office of Chavez County. The flying object landed on a ranch near Roswell sometime last week. Not having phone facilities, the rancher stored the disc until such time as he was able to contact the sheriff's office, who in turn notified Major Jesse A. Marcel of the 509th Bomb Group Intelligence Office. Action was immediately taken and the disc was picked up at the rancher's home. It was inspected at the Roswell Army Airfield and subsequently loaned by Major Marcel to higher headquarters. Yeah, I love how they say loaned to higher headquarters. That's that's almost as almost as good as surrendered to high command. Yeah, some general <laughs> some general called up. Hey, Major Marshall, can I borrow that from from you? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure that's how it happened. <laughs> but I- imagine what it would have been like, you know, to read that in the newspaper. Just the the, the army got a flying saucer. Uh, I mean, just coming out and saying it. How how dramatic that would have been. Mm. When I went to Roswell, I you know got a copy of the a pa- of the paper you know they have reproductions of it for sale i got a copy of it and was reading it and it's like wow this is just so dramatic to just have the military come out and say we've got a flying saucer i have to say it's almost like when the new york times reported on the a tip gun camera videos mm-hmm. from from a few years ago so that's interesting yeah only even more dramatic cuz it's like we have this physical object now right right then what happened was the Army retracted the story. Is that right? Within 24 hours, they dialed back the story. And on July 9th, many papers carried the retraction. So this is the next day. Uh, one of them was the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And here's what it said. An object found near Roswell, New Mexico, was stripped of its glamour by a Fort Worth Army Airfield weather officer who late Tuesday identified it as weather balloon. Warrant Officer Irving Newton of Medford, Wisconsin, a forecaster at the base weather station, said the object was a radar wind target used to determine the direction and velocity of winds at high altitudes. Newton said there were some 80 weather stations in the United States using this type of balloon, and it could have come from any one of them. We use them because they can go so much higher than the eye can see, Newton explained. A radar set is employed to follow the balloon, and through a process of triangulation, The winds aloft are charted, he added. Yeah, the uh, story and a lot of the press stories also carried pictures of Brigadier General Roger Ramey and Major Jesse Marcel, who you already mentioned, posing with debris from a weather balloon and a radar detector. So it wasn't just a weather balloon. It had like a radar target on it as well to keep track of the balloon. And, And so that basically just killed the story? Yeah, after that, the story died down for several decades. There were a few brief and often inaccurate mentions of it in UFO literature, but it was basically a dormant story at that point. So then how did it come back into popular consciousness? In 1980, a book called The Roswell Incident was published by Charles Berlitz. That's the language guy. You know, Hmm. if you've seen those Berlitz language books to like learn French or German or whatever, that's the guy. He and another guy named William William Moore wrote this Roswell Incident book, and that repopularized it. Then in 1989, the TV show Unsolved Mysteries aired a famous segment dramatizing the subject. Other books followed, including UFO Crash at Roswell, which was released in 1991 by Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt. And then in 1992, Crash at Corona by Stanton Friedman, who just recently passed on. And uh, in 1997, the day after Roswell, by Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso and William Burns was released. And Philip Corso was a military guy who claimed to have been given technology from Roswell that he then seeded in industry here in America to be reverse engineered. And so very interesting book. We'll definitely talk about that one in the future. One of the things that characterized this new wave of interest was the claim that in addition to the crash debris, which, you know, there had been no doubt existed, there were also uh, several small crash victims, according to the stories, one or two of which may have survived, at least temporarily. So people were saying there were bodies of small people and one or two of them may have lived at least temporarily. Another thing that characterized the new wave of interest was a lot of really unreliable witnesses came out of the woodwork. Uh, Subsequent deliberation and investigation showed that many of them were either misremembering or deliberately hoaxing in some cases. Uh, For a really balanced look at 
the problems with a lot of these newer witnesses, I, I would recommend you get Kevin Randall's book, Roswell in the 21st Century. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. It's one of the recommended resources for this episode. And Randall favors the extraterrestrial hypothesis. He, he I mean, that's his preferred solution. He, he, he wants to say it, it was a flying saucer from another planet. But he's a very fair and balanced investigator. In fact, I would say of all the people actively working in American ufology today, he is the most fair and balanced uh, person who favors the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And he's really frank about the limitations of the data and the problems with some of the witnesses. Now, I recall being of a certain age and having certain interests, I recall there being lots of Interest like this that grew. Uh, there were TV movies. I remember one, The X Files, was talking about Roswell. So eventually, public interest grew so strong that I understand the government had to issue a couple of reports at what happened at Roswell. So, what did they say? Yeah, there were some queries that were underway in the government by New Mexico politicians. And so, in 1994, the Air Force issued a document called the Roswell Report Fact versus Fiction in the New Mexico Desert. And it claimed that the crash debris was likely from Flight 4 of something called Project Mogul, which we'll talk about. Uh, it didn't offer a single definite explanation for the reports of the alien bodies. But since Project Mogul didn't have any passengers, it just said there weren't any bodies. In 1997, the Air Force then issued another document called the Roswell Report Case Closed, which did provide an explanation for the reports of the bodies. And it suggested that the bodies people remembered seeing were likely crash test dummies from another program called Operation High Dive, which we'll also talk about. Oh, well, if the, if the report was titled Case Closed, I'm sure nobody wanted to talk about it after that, right? Case <laughs> Didn't really close the case in a lot of people's minds. So what was this Project Mogul that they mentioned? Basically, it was a balloon-based project to detect Soviet nuclear tests. You know, this was right after World War II. We dropped the first bombs in 1945, and we knew the Soviets were having this, you know, desperate program to try to get their own bombs. They were successful in 1945. 49. So it took them like four years after the war before they detonated a bomb. But we were already monitoring what was going on to try to, you know, track their progress. And Mogul was one of the ways we were trying to do that. Basically, you sent up balloons and they had special sound gear on them that would listen for low frequency sound waves that travel through the atmosphere for thousands of miles. So the idea was basically with these special microphones you could hear the bang of an atomic bomb going off from thousands of miles away. And that would tell us if it's not one of ours, it would be one of the Soviets. Because we didn't have satellites to do what we do now. The, right. See it from space. So they had to find another way. Okay. Exactly. And so the uh, Roswell report that the Air Force released in 1994 has a pretty good explanation of Project Mogul. Why don't you read that for us? All right. Project Mogul was a then-sensitive classified project whose purpose was to determine the state of Soviet nuclear weapons research. This was the early Cold War period, and there was serious concern within the U.S. government about the Soviets developing a weaponized atomic device. Because the Soviet Union's borders were closed, the U.S. government sought to develop a long-range nuclear explosion detection capability. Long-range, balloon-borne, low-frequency acoustic detection was posed to General Spatz in 1945 by Dr. Maurice Ewing of Columbia University as a potential solution. Yeah. So what they would do, because you not only want to hear the bang, you also want to know where it was. So they would need to triangulate and they would send up multiple balloon trains in different locations and they needed to map where the balloon trains were when they would hear the bang. So they would have this trail of in addition to the balloon, which provides the lift you want, it would have the the acoustic equipment, and then it would also have tethered to the balloon uh, radar reflectors, so you could track the balloons on radar and use that for triangulation. And they had specially modified the microphones they were using. They were based on sauna boys that the Navy had developed for listening to like submarines and stuff like that, but they modified them to work with air 
instead of water and uh, sent them up. And in 1947, a team from New York University was conducting experimental launches uh, with this system out of Alamogordo, New Mexico, which is just 60 miles from Roswell. And according to the records, their fourth experimental flight, which was launched on June 4th, uh, 1947, was never recovered by the Project Mogul team. It was lost. And the Air Force in 1994 concluded that that's probably what the crash debris was from. It was from Flight 4 of Project Mogul. Okay. And then they also mentioned this other project called Operation High Dive. What was that? Uh, High Dive was an attempt in the 1950s to design a way to allow pilots and astronauts to eject at extremely high altitudes and survive. So it was basically an ejection system testing program. And the tests involved anthropomorphic dummies, you know, as you would expect. You want to see what the day you want to eject the dummy and then see what the damage is to get an idea of what would happen to a man. The dummies they used were somewhat shorter than a normal person. I'm not entirely sure why. It may be, I don't know, if pilots in this age tended to be shorter than normal, kind of like jockeys, so they could fit in the smaller aircraft, or I'm not sure. I think the higher altitude planes were more cramped cockpits, and they they recruited shorter pilots. Yeah. Also, weight was a big concern Mm -hmm. back then, and so they probably wanted lighter guys. In any event, they these crash test dummies were shorter than a normal person, and in 1997, the Air Force suggested that their efforts to recover these dummies because, you know, you got to, after they've ejected and hit the ground, you got to go get them to see what happened with them. That the efforts of military personnel to go recover the dummies was what produced uh, reports of military personnel recovering tiny people in the desert. So one thing we noticed is in both of these cases, we have some discrepancies in date. The yeah. mogul balloon went missing on June 4th, but the debris at Roswell wasn't reported in the newspaper until July 8th. And then the alien bodies, were reported in 1947, but Operation High Dive wasn't until the 1950s. So what gives here? I don't think the first one is really much of a problem. Mogul balloons were designed to stay in the air for extended periods. You didn't just send them up and haul them back down the same day. You had to have them up there listening for whenever the Soviets might set off a nuke. And so they were meant to stay up there for a long period of time. Apparently, Flight 4 which was, you know, launched on June 4th, was in the air until June 7th. And that's when things started to go wrong for it. Also, some records indicate, some early records indicate that Mac Brazel, he was the rancher that found the debris, that he found the debris three weeks before it was reported to the authorities. He found it in mid-June. So we know Flight 4 was still up in the air until the 7th. And then he finds it like the debris like a week later. He was on a remote ranch with no telephone or radio. He didn't go into town very often. And we uh, we don't know that he even found the debris right after the crash. It could have been laying there all week before he ran across it. So I don't see a fundamental problem with the date of the mogul launch relative to the time the newspapers announced the story. Okay. And then what about the date problem with the crash test dummy? Well, I think there's more of a problem here. At the press conference in 1997 where they announced this solution, it was asked, well, okay, Operation High Dive wasn't until the 50s, but Roswell was 47. So why the discrepancy in years? And the Air Force official who was speaking suggested it was time compression in people's memories, which got some laughs. I think it's possible, you know, that people could misremember the year. I say that from my own experience. People seem to think that I have a good memory, but I often don't remember the year something happened after it's been a few years. For example, I don't remember the exact year of my trip to Roswell. I think it was around 2007, about 12 years ago, but I could be off by, you know, a few years. I, it could have been, I don't think it was later than that, but it could have been earlier than that. I have to say, I think people's memories will often sometimes, in fact, do the opposite, which is, lock onto a memorable thing and misremember it because they tie it to that thing that wasn't the same time. So like if I remember something that actually happened in say 1988, but if for some reason uh, it seems like it might be connected to, I don't know, the space shuttle in mm-hmm. 19, the, the Challenger disaster, I could misremember it as 1986. Mm-hmm. I could, so I, could, I see what you're saying there. 
Yeah, and we'll definitely be talking about the problems with human memory in upcoming episodes because it's a fascinating subject. That's good. But the discrepancy in years is enough that I think there's at least something of a problem here because if, if you would think that if people remembered seeing alien bodies that they would also remember, oh, yeah, it was at the same time Roswell was in the news, that the crash was in the news. But I should also say there are problems with the reports, the bodies. They weren't there in the original 1947 reportage. Uh, this is from the second wave in the 1980s. And read, for example, Kevin Randall's discussion of the bodies. There are reasons to question whether any of these reports are reliable or not. And so I'm not at the present state of my research. I'm not sure there were bodies, although we'll definitely talk about that in another episode. But if there were, I'm not sure there were alien bodies. I, I'm going to guess that when we talk about this again, we'll talk about purported video or film footage and all that sort of stuff. Oh, like the alien autopsy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a hoax, but we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, it's, it's, I, I kind of guess it's a hoax, but it's it'd be fun to talk about. I love the X Files episode where they they riff on that yeah. by showing alien autopsy footage to Scully, and she's so embarrassed that she's the mass doctor in the <laughs> fake alien autopsy. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So that's so that's the background. So let's talk about the theories about what happened at Roswell. What are the theories about the Roswell incident? Okay, so there are lo there are loads of theories about this, but to keep it manageable, in this episode, we're going to look at six. The first one we're going to call Air Force Hypothesis One, uh, because it's the first one the Air Force proposed. Namely, it was a flying disc that they got. So flying saucer, presumably of extraterrestrial origin. Air Force Hypothesis Two was what they came out with the next day, that it was just a weather balloon. Air Force Hypothesis Three... Uh, which they came out with in 1994, was that it was a Project Mogul flight wreckage. And then Air Force Hypothesis 4 was that the bodies are to be explained by the Operation High Dive crash test dummies. In addition, we're going to talk at least somewhat about a couple of additional hypotheses that have been proposed recently by authors. The first one uh, you could call the Jacobson hypothesis. And basically, this holds that the Roswell crash was a Russian incursion into American airspace. In her book, Area 51, which is really a fun read, and re reporter Annie Jacobson notes that one of her sources for the book, retired official who worked with one of the agencies out at Area 51, claimed that the Roswell crash was the product of a Russian incursion, that Joseph Stalin apparently was trying to one-up Orson Welles's 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast and cause panic in the United States by making us think we were being invaded by aliens. The flying disc was a Russian craft designed to fool us into thinking it was an alien vehicle. And according to Jacobson's source, the alien bodies were children that had been subjected to medical experiments by the Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele, who, according to this source, had worked for Joseph Stalin for a while after the war. Wow. So. That's the, what Jacobson was told. Another one is by, uh, you could call it the Redfern hypothesis, says that basically we had some medical experiments go awry. And in a couple of his books, Body Snatchers in the Desert and the Roswell UFO Conspiracy, Nick Redfern proposes that this was a government, a U.S. government experiment gone wrong. The crashed vehicle was either a balloon or another craft under our control. And the bodies were people we were doing high altitude survival experiments on, possibly including Japanese prisoners of war, because, you know, the war just ended two years earlier, possibly other prisoners and possibly children with birth defects. As usual, we'll push this from both faith perspective and reason perspective. What can we say about this from the faith perspective? Not a lot. Obviously, if aliens exist, it raises theological questions, which, yes, we will be devoting a future episode <laughs> to for everyone who has asked. But nothing about this incident in particular really raises its own faith questions. So then what can we say about this from the reason perspective? What, what about the, the first one, the extraterrestrial hypothesis? Here we kind of have to apply the standard Sherlock Holmes principle. What Once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however implausible, must be the truth. So in order to argue for aliens, we would need to strike down all of the alternative, more mundane hypotheses. So then let's approach the other ones one by one. 
What about the simple weather balloon hypothesis? Well, we can strike that off our list because the Air Force admitted it was false in 1994. Uh, while balloons may have been involved, it wasn't just an ordinary weather balloon. And then what about this, we, as we talked about, the crash test dummies hypothesis? I can't rule that out. I also, you know, don't find it particularly plausible. It's possible, but the discrepancy in the dating is significant. And also at this point in my studies, I'm not sure there were bodies. So I'm just going to kind of set that one aside. So now we have the, the, the uh, Andy Jacobson's Russian incursion hypothesis, which has an interesting parallel to a present day, which is people accusing the Russians of meddling in American society and trying to cause uproar uh, mm -hmm. through social media in the present day. But yeah, through, just like we do with them. Right. But in this case, they think it's alien fever. So what about that one? Jacobson received a lot of criticism for this after her book, and it's a little unfortunate that she had it in the book because a lot of the rest of the book is very good. And I can't blame her for saying, well, this is what my source said. It's not like she's claiming independent knowledge of this. But personally, I don't really buy this one. I, I don't think we have good evidence, or certainly I don't have good evidence, that Stalin was even aware of Orson Welles's War of the Worlds broadcast. And for him to conduct construct this scheme afterwards, or at least to prove this scheme afterwards, where we're going to build something that looks like a flying saucer, and we're going to fly it into America, and we're going to have these medical experiment children get out of it and cause panic in the United States. As Jeeves from Jeeves and Worcester would say, there are just too many imponderables with this right. plan, too many things that could go wrong. And in fact, it it, it didn't <laughs> right. uh, work. So I, I find this one implausible. And again, I'm not sure that there even were bodies. Yeah, I mean, even the fact that, you know, you'd have to construct a, a this ship, this flying saucer to fly, a flying saucer, no mm -hmm. one had a flying saucer at the time, and that it would have to be plausibly something that could travel through space. That would be... Yeah, and I mean, when, once we had the device, we'd take it apart, obviously, or its wreckage apart, yeah. and it's like, oh, guess what? There's the Cyrillic alphabet right here, and this is stamped into this metal beam. It says "Made in Stalingrad" on this here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That, so that all right. So that's the the Russian incursion hypothesis. What about the medical experiment hypothesis? I think this one is more possible. If there were bodies, this would be a possible way of explaining them. The U.S. government has definitely experimented on people in unethical ways, and we'll talk about that in some future episodes. It's also apologized for doing so. This would explain why they would want the weather balloon cover story, because they'd want to keep the medical experiments classified. And we'll definitely talk about this more in the future, but for now, I'm not sure there were bodies. So that leaves us with the hypothesis we're going to consider today, uh, the Project Mogul and the, and the extraterrestrial hypothesis. How can we decide between them? There are several lines of argument. One concerns the materials that were found at the crash site. If you, if you read the literature or watch the, the Unsolved Mysteries segment that we'll have a link to, a lot of the eyewitnesses will talk about the materials that the crash debris were made out of. And, and describe them as having unusual properties. At least some of the witnesses say this. For example, here's what Mac Brazel's son, Bill, who handled the material, had to say. Dom, could you read that for us? There were only three items involved, something on the order of balsa wood and something on the order of heavy gauge monofilament fishing line and a little piece of, it wasn't really aluminum foil and it wasn't really lead foil, but it was on that order. A piece about the size of my fingers with ragged edges. Yeah, and he said he goes on to say the wood-like substance was allegedly difficult to whittle. You couldn't just whittle off bits of it with your knife. The fishing line, he said, you could shine a light in one end of it and it would be visible out the other, which has led some people to say it's fiber optic technology. And then concerning the foil-like material, Bill Brazel had this to say. I couldn't tear it. It didn't take pliers or anything. I just used my fingers. I didn't try to cut it with my knife. It was pliable, real pliable. I would bend it over, increase it, and if you straightened back up, there wouldn't be a crinkle in it. Nothing. It would flatten out. It was just as smooth as ever. Not a crinkle or anything. Yeah, and this is one that gets a lot of attention because it sounds like, sometimes people will call it memory metal, but it also sounds like metallic colored plastic that we would have today that you could like crumple up in your hand and then let go of it, and it would just expand back into a flat surface. 
So the issue really comes down to whether this material exhibited properties that 1940s material science could not produce. If it couldn't produce materials with, that displayed these properties, then that would be evidence that we were dealing with an extraterrestrial craft. Okay, so then what does the evidence suggest? Well, we have a problem with the fact that the reports of these strange properties in the material were made decades later. So people's memories had had a chance to drift. And also, these claims were made after the UFO story was out there. And so it could have shaped, the UFO story itself could have shaped people's memories of, you know, what exactly the properties were. I mean, if you handled, uh, for example, one, some of the claims, and we'll get into this a little more, but some of the claims will say things like, well, it was a silvered weather balloon. So that was rubbery. It was this plastic substance, but it had silvering on one side. So, yeah, you could take a piece of that and crumple it in your hand and let it expand back to what it looked like before. But after 40 years, how easy is it going to be to distinguish silvered rubber from a weather balloon with fantastic memory metal? You know, it's your memory after 40 years that can that could be hard to distinguish. So given the fact that people's memories distort over time, it's hard to be sure they're reliable. Also, the people who made the reports like this indicated that the materials were very similar to things they were familiar with, to other materials they did know about and were maybe just subtly different. It's thus hard to think that it was really impossible for 1940s material science to produce this stuff like the supposed fiber optic thing, which Bill Brazel said looked like monofilament fishing line. Well, mono, you can shine a light in one end of monofilament fishing line and it'll come out the other end. And monofilament fishing line began to be marketed in 1939. It had already been around for 12 years. I checked. Balsa wood, which he also said is, this was like balsa wood, but some people said it was hard to whittle. Well, balsa wood, if you cover it in glue, to reinforce it for making a kite out of it or something that you're going to send up on one of these things, that would be hard to hard to whittle. The glue would keep you from just shaving off pieces of it. Also, some people have reported it was like bamboo. And I know from when I was a kid, it is not easy to whittle bamboo. Right. It has a very tough outer surface. You, you really need to use a saw if you're going to try to get through bamboo. A pocket knife won't do it. Rubber that had been painted or covered in foil on one side could crumple and unfold again. And even if one of these substances wasn't in common use by ordinary people in New Mexico, in rural New Mexico, that doesn't mean it wasn't being used in government projects. Also, other people reported the materials being simply ordinary. They didn't, they didn't report any of these weird properties. They just described them as if they were ordinary materials. For example, within 24 hours of the initial announcement, Mac Brazel described the materials as just ordinary. There was a story carried in the Roswell Daily Record on July 9th. That's the day after the initial announcement that dealt with this. And why don't you read part of that for us? They picked up the rest of the pieces of the disc and went to his home to try to reconstruct it. According to Brazel, they simply could not reconstruct it at all. They tried to make a kite out of it, but could not do that and could not find any way to put it back together so that it could fit. Then Major Marcel brought it to Roswell, and that was the last he heard of it until the story broke that he had found a flying disc. Russell said that he did not see it fall from the sky and did not see it before it was torn up, so he did not know the size or shape it might have been, but he thought it might have been about as large as a tabletop. The balloon which held it up, if that was how it worked, must have been about 12 feet long, he felt measuring the distance by the size of the room in which he sat. The rubber was smoky gray in color and scattered over an area about 200 yards in diameter. When the debris was gathered up, the tin foil, paper, tape, and sticks made a bundle about 3 feet long and 7 or 8 inches thick, while the rubber made a bundle about 18 or 20 inches long and about 8 inches thick. In all, he estimated the entire lot would have weighed maybe 5 pounds. There was no sign of any metal in the area which might have been used for an engine and no sign of any propellers of any kind, although at least one paper fin had been glued onto some of the tin foil. There were no words to be found anywhere on the instrument, although there were letters on some of the parts. Considerable scotch tape and some tape with flowers printed upon it had been used in the construction. No strings or wire were to be found, but there were some eyelets in the paper 
to indicate that some sort of attachment may have been used. Brassel said that he had previously found two weather observation balloons on the ranch, but that what he found this time did not in any way resemble either of these. I'm sure that what I found was not any weather observation balloon, he said, but if we find anything else beside a bomb, they're going to have a hard time getting me to say anything about it. Right, because he didn't like all the negative attention he had received from reporting this. Right. So he described the materials apparently to the paper as just being ordinary stuff, tinfoil, paper, tape, sticks. Now, you can argue he did this because he was being threatened by the Army Air Force or something as part of the cover-up. But the fact is, we have the discoverer of the material describing it as ordinary stuff within 24 hours of the first public report, not 40 years later. Now, he did say it wasn't a weather balloon, and that's true. It wasn't. Uh, he's describing the stuff that would have been hanging from the weather balloon, the radar reflective kites that it carried. And in fact, they tried to make a kite out of it. They probably, uh, if on the mogul theory, they probably had more than one kite here, which is why they couldn't fit it together properly. But they, their first thought was, oh, this is stuff you'd make a kite out of. Let's try to make a kite out of it. Also, notice the absence of anything bulky enough to be an engine. The whole thing allegedly weighs like five pounds, all of the debris that he brought in. And this really sounds more like a, fla a fragile balloon train than any kind of alien spaceship. So then how did the, the idea of it being a flying disc get started? It's a key question. And at first, you'd think there would be two possibilities. The first possibility is it really was a flying disc, and the Army Air Force naively said so before realizing what a horrible mistake that was. And so they had to come up with the weather balloon story because they didn't realize how nuts people were going to go if they said they had a flying saucer. The alternative explanation would be, well, they they realized real fast it was Project Mogul, but they didn't want to let the public or the Soviets know that we had Project Mogul and that we were watching. And so uh, they thought, well, let's just cash in on the uh, flying saucer craze that's going on right now by saying we got a flying saucer. And then they realized that was a horrible mistake and they came up with the weather balloon story. So you'd think it was one of those two. But actually, there are additional explanations for how the term flying disc may have entered the topic. You'll remember this term was very new. It had only been coined in the last two weeks. It didn't have an established meaning, and it wasn't automatically associated with extraterrestrials. Lots of people thought the flying disks that were being reported were a secret government project. I mean, if you go back and listen to our Kenneth Arnold episode, we play a radio broadcast from uh, that time, and they're going, oh, yeah, we're, we've contacted the Army. We hope to have word back from them that this is just one of our projects. So people didn't think extraterrestrial when they thought flying disc. They could easily and often did think U.S. government. And then Mac Brazel, you know, he lived on a remote ranch with no phone or radio. So this term is entirely new to him. And with that in mind, there's another passage in that same July 9th story from the Roswell Daily Record that has a bearing on this. Could you read uh, that passage for us? Brazel related that on June 14th, he and an eight-year-old son, Vernon, were about seven or eight miles from the ranch house of the J.B. Foster Ranch, which he operates. When he, they came upon a large area of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tin foil, a rather tough paper, and sticks. At the time, Brazel was in a hurry to get his round made, and he did not pay much attention to it. But he did remark about what he had seen, and on July 4th, he, his wife, Vernon, his wife, Vernon, and a daughter, Betty, age 14, went back to the spot and gathered up quite a bit of the debris. The next day, he first heard about the flying disks, and he wondered if what he had found might be the remnants of one of these. Monday, he came to town to sell some wool, and while there, while here, he went to see Sheriff George Wilcox and whispered kind of confidential-like that he might have found a flying disk. Wilcox got in touch with the Roswell Army Airfield, and Major Jesse A. Marcel and a man in plain clothes accompanied him home, where they picked up the rest of the pieces of the disc and went to his home to try to reconstruct it. Right. So here, Brazel finds the debris on June 14th, and then three weeks later, uh, he sees the debris again on July 4th. And the next day, July 5th, he hears about flying discs for the first time. And he thinks, well, maybe that's what I found. 
he, and he's not necessarily thinking aliens. He's just he, like other people. He may think this is a government thing. So he goes into town when he's selling his wool and he reports it to the sheriff and the army gets involved. And so it may have been Brazel who introduced the term flying disc into this story. It didn't have an established meaning, but that's what he told the sheriff and the army officials he thought he might have found. They then go out and get this kite-like material and try to build a kite out of it. And it may have just been the his use of the term flying disc may have just kind of taken a lo- taken on a life of its own and gotten into the initial press release. Oh, yeah, he found a flying disc. And that didn't mean to people then that it was necessarily an extraterrestrial flying saucer. So is there any evidence that would tend to confirm this interpretation? Well, I can think of two significant pieces of evidence. The first one is an internal FBI telegram that was sent from the Dallas field office to the headquarters in Washington, D.C. It was sent at 6.17 p.m. Central Time on July 8th, just a few hours after the initial announcement that a flying disc had been discovered. And uh, you, maybe you could read that for us, Don. Major Curtin, headquarters, 8th Air Force, telephonically advised this office that an object purporting to be a flying disc was recovered near Roswell, New Mexico, this date, July 8, 1947. The disc was hexagonal in shape and was suspended from a balloon by cable, which balloon was approximately 20 feet in diameter. Major Curtin further advised that the object found resembles a high-altitude weather balloon with a radar reflector, but that telephonic conversation between their office and Wright Field had not borne out this belief. Disc and balloon being transported to right field by special plane for examination. Information provided this office because of nas- national interest in case and fact that National Broadcasting Company, Associated Press, and others attempting to break the story of location of the disc today. Major Curtin advised would request right field to advise Cincinnati office results of examination. No further investigation being conducted. Yeah, and it, the telegram is a little choppy in its syntax because of the way they compress things for yeah. telegrams. But basically, according to this telegram, so this is the government talking to itself. OK, this is what the Air Force told the FBI that day, that it was a balloon related thing. They said there was a hexagonal disc that was suspended from a 20 foot diameter balloon. So it was part of the balloon train. And if you've got this hexagonal disc as part of the balloon train, then that might be why Mac Brazel said he found a flying disc, because there was this hexagonal thing. And then the Air Force tells the FBI about that just a few hours later. And so I think that's significant evidence favoring the Project Mogul theory. Right. If you've ever seen a radar reflector, you, it, you can picture, you could you could probably Google it. It sort of has these angular foil metallic the shape and things. So I, I see what you're saying there. So mm-hmm. so you said there was a second piece of evidence. What was that? Yeah, this is in a book called Atomic Adventures by James Mahaffey. And I've mentioned James Mahaffey previously on the podcast. Uh, in particular, I've mentioned his book Atomic Accidents, which is a really great read, but so is Atomic Adventures. He talks about how in 1989, he encountered a piece of evidence And this is five years before the Air Force did its study and concluded it was probably mogul. But he encountered a guy who had a really important piece of information about this. In 1989, Mahaffey was kind of at an unhappy point in his career as a nuclear physicist because that was the year some scientists in Utah announced they had achieved tabletop cold fusion. And Mahaffey's team was one of the groups trying to replicate their results. And they, their initial results were promising. It looked like they'd replicated what the Utah scientists found. And so everyone was all excited about cold fusion. And then it turned out there was a problem in their equipment that produced unreliable results. And so Mahaffey's team in Georgia just had egg all over their faces. They, were, uh, they, were, they really wanted this story to go away. And Mahaffey himself was sick of answering calls about cold fusion. Then, on April 30th, 1989, a visitor came to see him at the Georgia Tech Research Institute. The visitor was a guy named Judge Clarence, or Clarence H., quote-unquote, Judge Ellison, that was his nickname. And he was a retired industrialist and physicist who was living in the area. 
he was there to discuss cold fusion with Mahaffey. But first, he told Mahaffey about his work on Project Mogul. This is what he said in the book. The goal of Mogul was to detect Soviet A-bomb tests from a great distance. The Soviet Union was thought to be involved in a crash program, or a crash program, to come to parity with the United States in nuclear weapons, and the fate of Western civilization was at stake. Knowing when secret, nu secret nuclear airbursts occurred was part of the counter-strategy. It was vitally important that the Soviets not know that we were developing methods to secretly monitor their progress toward making atomic bombs. They had to think that their secrets were still secret, and unfortunately it had been proven during the last war that our most sensitive activities were riddled with Soviet spies and an impressive intelligence-gathering system. Mogul would have to be as contained and secure as could be managed. All personnel would be thoroughly vetted and monitored 24 hours a day, and there would be cover stories on top of cover stories. Mahaffey then goes on to describe in great detail how the Mogul balloon trains worked and how they adapted the Navy hydrophones to work in the atmosphere. He also provides this comment. Weather balloons, which were by 1948 being used to find the temperature, air pressure, and humidity in the unmeasured regions of the upper atmosphere, would typically rise until the balloon burst. The below freezing temperatures would make the rubber balloon brittle, and in the low air pressure, the helium filling the balloon would expand until the cold rubber reached the end of its elasticity. Right. So that is a possible explanation for why the balloon would burst and end up all over the ground in these pieces, because it's it's up there, it's it's brittle because of the cold, and then it bursts, and that's why you get bunches of pieces of at least one of the balloons, explaining the rubber strips that they said they found. To combat that kind of accident, mogul balloons were equipped with an altitude control mechanism, so they didn't get that high, but Flight 4 went awry, and so it could have gotten up that high. Multiple balloons had to be sent to different places so they could triangulate the location of the nuclear test. This required knowing the locations of the balloons, so they were fitted with these radar reflectors made of aluminum-coated paper and sticks, which were called the kite. And then the electronics package consisted of a Navy ERSB, that's Expendable Radio, radio Sonoboy, model AN slash CRT-1. So Mahaffey claims his source even told him the model number of the electronics package they were using. And this is what would detect the blast. And this is further Mahaffey. Judge Ellison's job was to figure out how to re-engineer a hydrophone and make it sensitive to infrasound signals transmitted in thin air at frequencies below the threshold of human hearing. On June 4th, 1947, they re released test flight number four and quickly lost sight of it as it climbed away. On June 7th, events began to unravel at the Roswell Army Airfield, 60 miles from the launch point at Alamogordo. It was reported that the balloon string had come down on the plains east of the Sacramento Mountains. The balloons, still having some lift cap capability, had dragged the string for miles, shredding the fragile radar corner reflectors, and spreading debris over a long stretch of ground. Personnel from Roswell were sent immediately to recover the sonobuoy and especially the flying disc, which was the code name of Ellison's special microphone, before anybody stumbled over it. And Brazel then found the rest of the debris. They recovered the microphone, which they called the flying disc, according to Mahaffey's source, Judge Ellison. Uh, that's another way the term flying disc could have gotten into the reportage. Someone familiar with Project Mogul could have known that nickname and talked about it. Yeah, we recovered the flying disc, and that got into the press release that way, possibly. Then Brazel found all the non-classified stuff, and the rest of the story got set in motion. Notice Mahaffey is being told this five years before the Air Force uh, comes out with the Mogul explanation. So it seems to me that that's a significant point of evidence in favor of of the mogul explanation. You have this source claiming that's what it was before the Air Force did. Are there other reasons to think that Project Mogul Theory may be correct? There, I have, there are certain impressions that lead me in that direction. Uh, the first one is it seems like whatever crashed at Roswell was pretty fragile, despite uh, the properties that are sometimes attributed to the wreckage. It obviously wasn't all that tough because the wreckage was in small pieces. 
I mean, maybe you had a hard time puncturing the rubber with your tearing the rubber with your fingers or something, but something caused it to shred. Same thing with maybe you have trouble whittling these sticks, but they broke. So it doesn't seem to have been that tough. And it wasn't like there was a big flying saucer, you know, sitting on the ground or half of a flying saucer, whatever it was, just disintegrate. Also, by all accounts, the debris were flimsy. They were made out of torn sheets of something, paper or tinfoil or rubber with stick-like things and string-like things. And if you think about sheets and sticks and strings, that sounds like what you build a radar reflective kite out of, not what you build a flying saucer out of. There was no apparent engine or anything large enough and heavy enough to provide a power source that witnesses reported seeing. And so that's kind of one impression. It also seems to me that an advanced alien craft ought to be tougher than this. Right. If it's made of advanced materials, why would it just shred like this? Some have said, well, it was hit by lightning in a thunderstorm. But our own 20th century aircraft get hit by lightning all the time and are just fine. My aunt was a stewardess in the 1970s, and she was on planes that got hit by lightning. That's a normal thing. Passengers, unless they see the flash, won't even notice that the plane has been hit by lightning. So why would an advanced flying saucer, you know, crash if it's hit by lightning? Also, third impression, if we really got a flying saucer in 1947, why would the government take as little interest in the subject as it seems to have done with modern UFO programs like ATIP having to struggle for funding? You'd think they take they would take it a lot more seriously if they really got a flying saucer in 47. Even if it was secret, they'd still be funding these UFO programs like crazy. Now, there are counter arguments to those impressions, which is why I just say they're impressions. Unfortunately, we don't have time in this episode to go into all the counter arguments. But I would suggest uh, that people who are interested read the book, read books from multiple perspectives on this. I've given you the perspective that based on the current state of my research, I tend to lean towards now, I would love this to be extraterrestrial. I would love to have <laughs> proof of, of alien life. Sure. I would also love us to have a craft we could reverse engineer. But based on all the evidence in Toto, it seems to me like the mogul explanation is more likely to be true. But I'm going to have multiple books to recommend from different perspectives, read the different perspectives, see the arguments that people are using. Or just wait for us to cover them on the podcast, because we will be coming back to this. This is kind of like the Kennedy assassination. It's a wellspring that we need to revisit more than once. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on Roswell? Well, I can't 100% eliminate alternative explanations, including the extraterrestrial hypothesis. But at the present state of my research, if I had to bet, my money would be on the Project Mogul explanation. Before we close... I'd like to have a brief sidebar that touches back on the Kenneth Arnold sightings that occurred two weeks before, because in Mahaffey's book, Atomic Adventures, he's got a footnote. So you have to look at the footnotes to notice this. But he's got a footnote where he has a mogul related explanation for what Kenneth Arnold saw. So if you could read that for us. On May 29th, 1947, mogul flight number three was released. It was a configuration duplicate of flight number four. The balloons apparently ran into high-speed wind at altitude and disappeared from radar heading north. Flight number three was never recovered. Kenneth Arnold's sighting 26 days later on June 24, 1947, of a string of nine shiny objects flying as if they were tied together, like a Chinese kite tail, may be a description of the top segment of the Mogul balloon vehicle blown all the way up to Mount Rainier in the high-altitude jet stream. The top segment was separated from the rest of the string by an electrically activated explosive squib as it reached 45,000 feet. The portion of the vehicle string would have been nine polyethylene balloons looking highly reflective and metallic at a distance. The top two would have been big, one-kilogram balloons separated by 36 feet of braided nylon rope, known as lobster twine. After another 79 feet of rope, a series of seven smaller 350 gram balloons would have followed, each spaced at 20 foot intervals. If so, then Arnold's description of the speed and distance of the objects would have been misjudged. Right. So I find that interesting. You have this train of balloons all tied by cord, and if that's what Arnold saw, it would explain the saucer like skipping motion 
that he saw as the the they're pulling on each other through the lobster twine, and that's what's causing them to seem to bounce up and down as they're traveling through the sky. It would also explain why the lead object looked different than the objects following it. So I think that's an interesting explanation of the Kenneth Arnold sighting. Uh, personally, and I'd love to see it analyzed by someone like Bruce Maccabee, I can kind of anticipate part of what he's going to say. What I don't know is, would it is it really plausible that flight number three would stay in the air lost for 26 days and I'll end up all the way in, in and end up all the hundreds of miles away in Washington state. So that I don't know, but I, based on what Maccabee said in his book, a length analysis of the Kenneth Arnold sighting, he would at least make a couple of points. One of them is that Arnold had good sighting fixture. He had a good fix on the locations of these because he was measuring them against a background of mountains with a clock. Uh, Mahaffey says, well, Arnold would have had to have misjudged the speed in the distance. But Maccabee would say, yeah, but he was using mountains and a clock to judge this. The other thing that I'm sure that Maccabee would say is Arnold reported the flash off the metallic objects he saw as bright enough to illuminate his aircraft cabin. And that would not happen with uh, silvered balloons in the distance. Right, right. They'd have to be really close to, to that. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer our listeners on Roswell? First one is the Air Force's reports on Roswell. They're uh, bound in a single edition that you can get, offering both the Project Mogul and the Crash Test Dummies explanations. Then there's James Mahaffey's book, Atomic Adventures, which provides the pre-Air Force Mogul confirmation we talked about. There's a summary of the Air Force crash test dummy theory that's online that you can read for free. We've got Kevin Randall's book, Roswell in the 21st Century, which supports the extraterrestrial hypothesis, but is a very good analysis. It's very frank about uh, problems in the data. Nick Redfern's book, The Roswell UFO Conspiracy, where he talks about his medical experiment hypothesis. Also, his book, Body Snatchers in the Desert, which is where he first introduced the medical experiment hypothesis. Annie Jacobson's book, Area 51, which has the Russian infiltration hypothesis. And even if you don't buy that, it's still a really good read. Say if you become a $10 patron of of our of the StarQuest Network, well, we could send you that one as a gift to thank you for your uh, patronage. Yeah. Also, there's a critique of Jacobson's book uh, that we'll have a link to so you can get the other side of the story. Wikipedia's article on the Roswell UFO incident will have also links to the July 8th, F 1947 FBI telegram, the July 9th story from the Roswell Daily Record, the July 9th retraction article from the Fort Worth Star Telegram, and images from the July 9th press conference where you can see General Ramey and Major Marcel posing with the uh, some of the debris that they claim to have been recovered. We'll also have a link to the Unsolved Mysteries segment that you can watch on YouTube and also Wikipedia's article on Project Mogul. And I look forward to coming back to revisit Roswell in the future. Yeah. So uh, what do we have for mysterious feedback, Jimmy? In our mysterious feedback this time comes from our episode on Fatima. And our first is an email from Fernando. Why don't you read that for us? So Fernando says, thanks for all you do at Catholic Answers and for your Mysterious World podcast. Regarding Fatima, I love the podcast. As a Portuguese person, I just wanted to let you know that the C in Lucia is pronounced as an S, like Lucy in English, not as uh, CH or CH. And the J in Jacinta is pronounced as a J, uh, in Jacinta is pronounced as a J like Janet. It's in the Spanish language that the J is pronounced as an H. I, I think that my, some of that's a little my influence, I have to say, because my daughter's name is Lucia, which is from the Italian. <laughs> I see. And my background, I really appreciate it, Fernando. Um, I love languages. Portuguese, unfortunately, I have not had a chance to study uh, significantly. And so I really appreciate the pronunciation correction, and I will use it going forward. My background has, I've had much more exposure to Spanish, which I is taught in American schools. And so I had exposure to Spanish growing up. And I, since Portuguese is related to Spanish, I tend to default to Spanish when I'm encountering Portuguese. But thank you so much. So then we got an email from Kathleen who writes, so after listening to this episode, 
I, as an evangelical Christian, find myself leaning towards the view that this spirit was of a demonic origin, and here is why I say that. You did mention, as it is written in 1 John 4, 1, test the spirits. In light of those scriptures, the spirit Mary falls short on three points in my view. One, calls for worship of herself. Two, calls unto question our salvation. Three, claims God will punish the world. How do you reconcile these discrepancies to make the claim that the spirit Mary is from God? I appreciate Kathleen's approach to this. And, you know, we talked a little bit about how in the episode about how someone coming from a Protestant perspective might have some difficulty with this. I would say in regard, so the three points that Kathleen raises, the first one, Mary didn't call for worship of herself. What she said was that my son, Jesus, wishes to establish a devotion to her Immaculate Heart in the world. And what that language means is not what it would sound like to Protestant ears. Having a devotion doesn't mean giving someone divine worship. It means having a form of respect for and the fact that Mary, on the Catholic view, and on anybody's view, if you're a Christian, Mary is a very holy woman. And on the Catholic view, by God's grace, he gave her the gift early that he will one day give all of us of being completely freed from sin. So, you know, we're not going to be sinning in heaven. He's going to make all of us immaculate one day. And he just gave Mary that early as a sign of what we will become as Christians if we're faithful to God. And so by establishing a devotion to or, you know, respect or veneration for Mary as an immaculate person, it shows us what God wants us to become. So it's not giving her divine worship. It's making an example of Mary for us to follow and imitate and stay true to God. In terms of calling into question our salvation, uh, I don't recall the apparition saying anything like that. Now, there are many Protestants who will say, you know, it's possible for a person to lose salvation, uh, something that Catholics believe as well. You know, Lutherans will say that, Methodists will say that, Pentecostals will say that. Basically, everybody except Baptists and Calvinists and those who have been influenced by Baptists and Calvinists will agree that it's possible, as as St. Paul says, to fall from grace. Fortunately, the good news is that you can then come back to God and be re-forgiven, which is the whole point of the parable of the prodigal son, where you have someone start as a son, go off into a life of sin and be described by the father as dead, and then come back to the father and be described as alive again. But I don't recall Our Lady of Fatima questioning our salvation in any sense. I mean, frankly, I don't remember such a quote. Even if there were a quote saying you need to avoid mortal sin, well, that's something that I think is biblically sound, and a lot of Protestants would agree with that. Everybody, like I said, but Baptist Calvinists and those influenced by Baptists and Calvinists. Concerning the third claim that God will punish the world, this is a mode of language that's found in Scripture. I mean, it's all over the place in Scripture that God's going to punish Israel for its sins and so forth. And I don't see any problem. Now, you can say how literal is that language meant to be taken? How much is it God actively punishing versus allowing the consequences of our sins to, to come home to roost? But whether it's meant literally or, or somewhat less literally, that mode of language is found in Scripture, and so I wouldn't be at all surprised to see it being used in a private revelation. The next bit of feedback comes from Basil from China on YouTube. It says, Thanks, Jimmy and Dom, for the hard work. I don't miss an episode. One advice on the structure of the podcast. Because of the amount of information you guys share, I can tell you're really trying to make it as easy as possible for us to follow. I would really suggest to explain the facts before you list the different claims and possible explanations. It's kind of backward and hard to follow when you say, here are the different theories to explain what happened. But I'm like, wait, I don't even know what happened yet. I appreciate that, Basil. Thank you so much. It's a challenge to try to figure out how to sequence the material sometimes. And it's something I continue to experiment with. I do try to have a you know, a, at least a basic kind of background knowledge established before we get into the theories. Since we're dealing with listeners from other parts of the world, though, I may unconsciously at times assume they're more familiar with something that isn't as well known in other countries. So that may be part of the issue, but I do pay conscious attention to this. 
And I appreciate your thoughtfulness and I continue to work on this because I want to get the balance right for everybody. And then Lauren on Facebook says, no, don't you dare make me wait until October to find out about the third secret, Jimmy. The catechism strictly forbids torture. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling, uh, but uh, I'm afraid uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to wait till October, but it'll be here before you know. Uh, cliffhangers are totally not against the catechism. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then in mysterious headlines, Jimmy, what do we have this week? First one is an article on mysterious lights on the moon's surface. These are known as transient lunar anomalies. And obviously, people are wondering, are is it aliens? Other naturalistic explanations include maybe it's gas pockets kicking up dust that's reflecting sunlight. But one way or another, there are and have been for a long time. We've known about these transient lunar lights. And so we got an article on them. Also, an article on did the moon once have life? Because in the history of the solar system, the moon was not always the way it was now. And so we've got uh, an article on the possibility of the moon once having the right conditions for life. So in a second, we'll talk about what we're going to have uh, on our next on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. But first, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Deborah F., Julie M., Tony S., SB Writing Service, and Barbara G., their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And I want to make a quick plug for another show on the network, a brand new show that I'm doing with my wife, Melanie. It's called Raising the Bets. And we talk about the adventures we have with our five kids that we homeschool here outside of Boston. We talk about food we cook, the books we read, Catholic faith stuff that comes up and interesting contemporary topics like uh, recently we talked about what makes a neighborhood a livable community. So uh, check that out at sqpn.com slash bets, B-E-T-T-S. So Jimmy, what's going to be uh, coming up next on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World? Next, at the request of our patrons, we're going to be talking about Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet. Excellent. So stay tuned for next week. And so that's it from us. Uh, what did you think about the Roswell UFO crash? What's your theory? What do you think is was it Mogul uh, Project Mogul? Was it was it aliens? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page and leave us some feedback there. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. No spaces on that, please. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links for the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>